using that tool toter right there, Joe, while Tech and I fill you in on the product and service information we picked up at the new model training session. Sounds good to me, Bob. You know, learning about the new model sure beats working on the old ones. I'd put it another way, Joe. Learning about the new models will sure make working on them a lot easier. Now suppose we cut the small talk and get down to brass tacks on what's new for 66. Why don't you start with something obvious, like the curved door glass on the belvedere's and coronets, Bob? Good idea, Tech. Curved glass on belvedere's and coronets means just about everything under the door trim is new on these models. For instance, hardtop and convertible front doors now use a single arm regulator and an entirely new setup at the front door glass guide. That glass guide and weather strip design is kind of interesting. The weather strip is attached to the front edge of the glass instead of being attached to the glass channel. You mean the weather strip slides up and down in the channel instead of the glass sliding in the weather strip? Exactly, Joe. A pair of Dacron flocked shoes near the top of the glass and another pair near the bottom of the glass fit into channels formed in the glass guide. These shoes virtually lock the glass into the guide channel for stable, quiet glass operation. What locks the weather strip to the glass? Both the shoes and the weather strip are locked in place by a pin that goes through a hole in the glass. Pretty slick. That should make shoe and weather strip replacement pretty simple. It does, Joe. And you'll find that glass guide and shoe set up on the bigger models, as well as belvedere's and coronets. As a matter of fact, door and quarter glass adjustments on models with curved glass, except Imperial, are now the same or very similar. I don't want to turn this into a body service session, but I think we ought to tell Joe about a few things that might stump him, like the new inside safety door handle, the door weather strip clips, and cemented rear window. It's pretty obvious why this new inside door handle is unusually safe. Since you have to pull the handle away from the door to open it, there's very little chance that anyone will accidentally open the door from the inside of the car. But here's something that isn't so obvious. The remote control link is attached to the remote control with a spring retaining clip. The harder you push on the link to disconnect it, the tighter the clip grasps the link. Since the link and the clip are behind the inner panel where you can't see them, you'll have trouble figuring out how to release that clip. To release the control link, use a small thin bladed screwdriver to spread the retainer. You have to do this by feel, but it's easy enough once you understand that spring clip arrangement. Knowing how sure beats tearing things out by the roots. Now, What's the story on the door weather strip retainers? Weather strips are cemented above the belt line, but retained by plastic fasteners below the belt line. Those fastening clips are kind of interesting. The plastic clips are springy. When you push them into holes in the door panel, they compress, then spring open again, and tiny serrations grip the door panel. All you have to do to release a clip from the door panel is push downward on the clip with a screwdriver or trim stick. Don't try to remove a weather strip without releasing the clips, or you'll ruin the weather strip or break the clips. Can you replace a broken clip? You sure can, Joe. Just work the T-shaped end of the clip out of the weather strip and install a new one in its place. Any more questions? Just happen to have one on rear windows, Tech. I noticed that some of the two-door hardtops don't seem to have a rubber weather strip around the rear window glass. What's the scoop? You are looking at one of the models with a cemented-in rear window. An adhesive caulking material is used between the rear window glass and the fence instead of a rubber weather strip. Bob will give you the highlights of the rubber spacers and the rubber dam used in this setup. A pair of rubber spacers are used to position the glass in the window opening. These spacers support the glass until the adhesive caulking compound cures. Another type of rubber spacer, called a spacer dam, provides a cushion between the glass and the body fence. It's called a dam because it keeps the adhesive caulking compound from squeezing out over the surface of the glass opening. Before the window is installed, a bead of adhesive caulking compound is applied between the spacer dam and the edge of the glass. And once the glass is in place, the glass, the rubber spacer dam, the adhesive caulking, and the body fence make a watertight sandwich. Now here's one feature of this type of glass installation. In case of a water leak, additional adhesive caulking can be applied to seal the leak. You'll find the service details in your reference book. 
The design came out a bit too late to get into the service manuals. Say, I noticed that one of our new Chryslers has a rear seat heater. I didn't have time to figure out how it works, so maybe you two can explain it to me. Glad to accommodate you, Joe. The Chrysler rear seat heater is a combination heater, defroster, and defogger. It's a recirculating system, having its own two-speed blower, its own heater core, and its own vacuum-controlled water flow valve. I think the easiest way to explain how the system works is to explain what the two control switches do. One switch is electrical and controls blower speed, off, low, or high. Now, the other is a vacuum switch. It gives you heat, defrost, or defog. With vacuum switch on heat, a vacuum actuator opens the water valve and sends hot water to the heater core. A second vacuum actuator moves an air control door so that hot air is directed downward and out through floor level discharge ducts on either side of the rear seat. With a vacuum switch set for defrost, the water valve actuator opens the water valve, sending hot water to the heater core. The air door actuator directs hot air upward and out through the package shelf duct to defrost the rear window. In warm weather, you may want defogging without heat. When the vacuum switch is flipped to defog, the vacuum actuator in the engine compartment closes the water flow valve. The actuator at the air control door directs unheated air upward and out through the defog duct in the package shelf. I'm glad to find out how that heater works, just in case I have to service one. Now tell me, are there any more body, heater, or accessory changes I should know about? There are several items worth mentioning, Joe. For instance, Coronet and Belvedere models now have a ram-type fresh air vent on the driver's side. How about the passenger side? The right side fresh air vent is part of the heater assembly. The vent control door directs fresh air into the car when it's open or feeds fresh air to the heater when it's closed. The new Belvedere Coronet heater is the blend air type. The heater core is always hot. Outlet air temperature is controlled by the position of the temperature control door. Now here's something you should know about this heater. Correct heater defroster door adjustment is very important. And there's a special tool that holds the heater defroster crank arm while you clip the control cable to its bracket. You'll find more about heaters in the reference book. You'll also find more body items like the Coronet and Belvedere parallel windshield wipers with wiper motor in the engine compartment and the drive linkage on the passenger side of the firewall. There's a new six-way power seat adjuster. A rack and pinion provides fore and aft movement. Screw jacks control the up and down as well as the tilt adjustment. There are new reclining seats. One type has an adjustable headrest. There are a few more odds and ends on body but I'll let you find out about them by reading the reference book. Right now, well, one of you master technicians out there turn the record so we can hear about some of the nuts and bolts type changes. Why don't we cover the remaining highlights by starting at the engine and working our way back through the transmission and drivetrain? That sounds logical to me, Tech. Although we have the same basic 6 and V8 engine designs as last year, a couple of exciting new engines have been added. And one of these is a new 440 cubic inch job. The other is a new 426 Hemi head option. What's the bore on that new 440 engine? It's four and five sixteenths inches, and that calls for a new piston ring tool. I've ordered a new piston ring tool to service the larger compression rings used in the 440 engine. I don't expect to be doing a ring job on a 440 real soon, but I want to have the tool when I do need it. Another new tool is this torque wrench adapter for Hemi head engines. On these jobs, the eight special stud nuts in the valve chamber are very close to the valve chamber wall. You can't torque them correctly without this adapter. Won't putting an adapter on a torque wrench change the torque readings? It sure will, Joe. But we came up with a simple formula that'll let you correct for the adapter length. All you have to do is multiply the recommended torque spec by the effective length of your torque wrench and divide by the combined length of the torque wrench and adapter. This gives you your corrected torque. The effective length of the torque wrench is the distance from the handle pivot point to the square socket drive. Just add two inches to that for the combined length. Sounds simple enough. It is, Joe. Now, here's a change you should know about. 
From now on, this wide blade distributor rotor will be the only type supplied for sixes and eights. No more narrow blade rotors. Before we get off the subject of engines, I'd better tell you about an engine mount change. It affects all eight-cylinder models, except compacts and imperials. The new 45-degree shear-type front engine mounts are located lower and closer to the center line of the engine. Now, this change does several desirable things. Bringing the engine mounts closer together tends to soften the roll or lateral rocking motion of the engine. Letting the engine roll easily reduces the amount of engine vibration transmitted to the passenger compartment at idle speed. And perhaps even more important, the new mounts are tuned to absorb objectionable suspension vibrations. In other words, the new mounts absorb both engine and suspension vibrations. But enough about engines. We better cover the transmission and shift linkage changes with Joe. Now, why don't you start with the torque flight changes? Good idea, Tech. Extensive changes have been made in both the A727 and the A904 torque flight transmission. Now, most of these changes were brought about by the elimination of the rear pump and the addition of the internally actuated parking sprag. A few others come under the heading of product improvement. As you know, when a car is pushed or towed, the rear pump is driven by the rear wheels instead of the engine. That means a rear pump supplies hydraulic pressure for push starting and lubrication pressure for towing with the rear wheels turning. Very few owners are interested in push starting. It's too apt to bend things up. So the rear pump feature is no longer very important to most owners. Here's something that is important. If you're going to tow a 1966 car with torque flight, pick up the rear wheels or disconnect the drive shaft. Eliminating the rear pump must have brought about other changes. Because of the hydraulic circuit changes, the 66 torque flights have a new hydraulic system and they use a new valve body. I suppose these changes also affect service procedures and special tools. Yes, they do, Joe. The new adapters are needed for installing the front pump bushing to the correct depth. One adapter for the A727, the other for the A904. You'll now need a new adapter to install the overrunning clutch cam in an A727. That's because the rear pump's been replaced by an output shaft support. In other words, I better check the 66 service manuals before I start working on a 66 torque flight. Now, how about explaining the new park lock mechanism? The locking sprag is now actuated by a parking sprag rod. The sprag rod is connected to the manual valve lever and has an over-traveled spring device. You'll find out why in a minute. The other end of the sprag rod is a bullet-shaped cam device. When it's pulled into position between the locking lever and reaction plug, the cam action moves the locking lever into engagement with a parking lock gear. If the locking lever doesn't line up with a notch in the park lock gear, the over-travel spring is compressed. Spring pressure engages the locking lever as soon as it lines up with a notch in the gear. I get it. In all shift positions except park, the bullet-shaped cam doesn't contact the locking lever but going past reverse and into park actuates the locking lever. Sounds pretty simple and foolproof. It is, Joe. The detenting at the lower end of the column has been eliminated. Instead, a much stiffer detent spring is used at the manual valve. So watch out for that stiff spring when you disassemble a valve body. That's a good tip, Tech. Now, the manual valve is actuated by an upper selector lever, a lower selector lever, a torque shaft, and an adjustable control rod. That sure beats last year's cable setup. How about adjustment? You loosen the swivel clamp screw a few turns. Put the gear shift selector lever in park. Move the manual control lever into the park detent notch. That's the last detent when you move the lever rearward. With both gear shift lever and manual control lever in park, tighten the swivel clamp screw. That's all there is to column shift linkage adjustment. How about the console shift? On console shift models, there's no gating between neutral and drive. However, you must push a button in the shift knob to get into one, two, reverse, or park. You must also push this same button to get out of park. That's a good safety feature. That's for sure, Tech. Linkage adjustment is quite simple, Joe. On Valiant and Dark models, there's an adjusting lever at the lower end of the torque shaft. On other models... The adjustment is made at a swivel clamp located at manual valve lever. On all models, console and column shift as well, linkages are adjusted with gear shift and manual lever in park. 
The only other adjustment you might have to make is at the console release button. Chances are you won't have to make that one very often. If you do, you'll find it covered in the reference book. Now, before we run out of time, you better explain the new four-speed manual transmission shift mechanism to Joe. Okay, Tech. The new shift lever mechanism has a positive reverse lockout device that is released manually by lifting a T-handle. Lifting the T-handle releases a lockout pin and lets you move the shift lever sideways to get into reverse. All you need to adjust the shift linkage is this simple homemade alignment tool. It locks the shift mechanism in neutral while you adjust the three control rods. Now, while we're still on transmission, you'll need this new extension housing bushing remover and installer to surface torque flight and manual transmissions which have the sliding spline output shaft with small yoke. It'll remove the bushing easily and install it to the correct depth in the housing. You'll also need this seal installer to service the transmission extension housing oil seal on six cylinder models with torque flight. The tool also services manual transmissions with sliding spline and small yoke. To remove the seal on these same models, you'll need this new seal remover. We got a bigger version of that tool for sliding spline output shafts having a big yoke late last spring. We've time for one more 66 feature, and I'll tell Joe about it. It's the new high-accuracy speedometer drive. The number of teeth on both the output shaft worm gear and pinion gear has been almost doubled. Also, a larger selection of pinion sizes is now available. The new pinions come in three different basic diameters. To simplify servicing or changing the new pinions, there's a new pinion adapter. The new adapter simply adjusts the center-to-center -center distance between the output shaft worm gear and the pinion. How does that work? The new drive pinion adapter has an off-center bearing hole. It allows you to install the correct size drive pinion without installing a new adapter. Instead, put the proper pinion in place and turn the adapter so that the teeth numbers at the bottom of the adapter match the number of teeth on the pinion. And that takes care of that. You mean you're going to sign off now without mentioning brake, rear axle, or steering changes? I'm afraid so, Joe. Besides, what's new in those departments is covered in the reference book. And now, I'd like to ask all of you master technicians out there to give your customers and the 66 models the best of care again this model year. <laughs>